Well, good morning, church. Would you take your copy of God's Word and join me in turning to the New Testament Gospel of Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 28. And uh, it's so good to see each of you here today. And I hope you can tell we're all getting really excited about next weekend, the opportunity we have to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And uh, I want to encourage each of you, if you would, arrive just a few minutes early next week. Be ready to be a blessing. Welcome, everybody. We've got a lot of uh, greeters and hosts and hospitality, team workers, and all of that. But at the end of the day, that's something each of us should have a heart to do. Be in prayer for all of these services. I'm looking forward to doing a lot of preaching next weekend, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Just curious, any of you interested in the sunrise service? Very good. I thought it might just be me and one or two others, but I think we'll have a great time there. That's something we've never done before, and uh, who knows? It may catch on. It might be something we continue to do, but I have people in my life that I love who are really concerned about this season with coronavirus and all that stuff, and and, uh, I like to bill this service as a service that Dr. Fauci himself would attend if if he's the kind of guy that goes to church. Outdoor, socially distant, and I mention that because you probably know someone that's really gone through it in this season, and they might be afraid to come to a normal service, that's one that everyone can come to, and we're going to have a great time uh, next week, and it's going to be fantastic. Today we're finishing a series that we've been involved in, kind of a mini-series that we've entitled Come and See, and that title, of course, comes straight from the Bible. In our first work week, we went through John chapter 1, and we found three occasions in that first chapter where people were invited to come and see. They, they were invited to come and see that, that Jesus is the Lamb of God. That was all about salvation. They were invited to come and see and learn how God can give them strength. And, and then they were thirdly invited to come and see what a life of service for Jesus is all about. Last week we were in John chapter 4 and we met a lady whose name was not given in scripture, but she's often just called the woman at the well. And we learned in the midst of that study, one, God can save anybody. Nobody's beyond the reach of God's love and his grace. And then we also learned that God can use anyone who's willing to give their lives to him. Today our study is going to come from Matthew chapter 28. And this is a passage that that speaks of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's, It's also a passage that informs us why it is so important for those of us who know Jesus to invite those who've yet to meet Jesus into this discussion. In a sense, this text answers the question, when I invite people to Easter, exactly what am I inviting them to? Really is more about a bunch of services. It's more about Chick-fil-A on Saturday night, although I'm looking forward to that. It's about more than the teen event, it's about more than the mega egg drop the kids are going to enjoy. Not sure what that is yet, but they seem excited about it. It's, it's about more than the music our teams have been practicing. It's about, it's about more than all of that. It's, it's much, much deeper. And I think we're going to see the purpose for it all in this passage before us today. So if you're able, I'd like to invite you to join me in standing as we read the Word of God together. If you're glad to be in church this morning, say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 28. And I'll begin reading in verse 1. As I read aloud, I hope you'll be following along. The Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. The angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. Now, I'm going to read on. This announcement that Jesus was going to go before them into Galilee, it doesn't quite seem to fit in here. But as we're going to see today, that was a major, major emphasis of Christ. It was something he repeated over and over. It was something he had the angels tell those who were his followers. There was something that was going to happen in Galilee that was of great, great importance. Verse 8. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. 
And they came and held him by his feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee. There shall they see me. Again, this emphasis on get to Galilee. But I want you to go to verse 6, if you would, and, and we're going to see these words. Come see the place. Come see the place. Our Father, we're very grateful for the privilege it's ours to be able to open a word that you've inspired for us, you've preserved for us, and a word that by your Spirit you can reveal to us. And I pray that our hearts would be open today so that you could put in us exactly what it is we need to live for you this week. Lord, what an important time. I pray we would seize these moments you've given us for your glory, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. There's no other event in the history of the world that so changed things like the victorious, literal, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In that single event, Jesus validated his deity. He confirmed that he indeed is God the Son and that all he said is true. The resurrection of Jesus, as I said, proves to us that Jesus is God the Son. It, it verifies the truth of the prophecies in Scripture that predicted His coming and, and of His death and of His resurrection. It assures those who believe of our future resurrection and, and so much more. And In fact, the resurrection of Jesus not only provides us with the means of spiritual salvation, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead provides us with the the means to live a life that matters. As Jesus would say, the fulfilling life. We can't get there in our own power. We we might know we can't save ourselves, but I want you to know we don't have the capacity to, to live the life that matters most in the eyes of Jesus Christ in our own strength. We need the power, the resurrection power of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans 6. He said, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Paul said, as a believer, you've got a new life. And it comes by way of the resurrection power of Jesus. He enables us to walk into this life that God has given. The living hope found in Jesus means we can have hope in our lives. And because Jesus is alive, we can have a future before us that is incredible. And and more than that, it's a future that is eternal. The apostle Peter wrote of this. In 1 Peter 1, he put it this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Here's how the hope comes, he says, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Friends, it's important for us to understand as a church, we could not possibly make too big of a deal about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. All of the work, all of the emphasis, frankly, all of the finances we've spent, printing uh, uh, thousands and thousands of invitations, all of this, it would be impossible for us to make too big of a deal about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is of such importance. It deserves all of the attention we'll give it next week and more. I hope that you will join me in praying And inviting others so that they can come and see what it's all about. We know those original followers of Jesus invited others, but it wasn't that way initially. That's not how it all began. In fact, to a person, they thought that the story was over when Jesus died. And interestingly, it was a group of ladies, not not the original apostles. It It was a group of ladies who had been following Jesus who really got things moving. They were the ones that led to incredible, incredible change. Again, Jesus, he prepared his disciples for this very moment, and it was a moment they missed. As Jesus taught the 12, he said to them in Mark 8, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What did they do to a man? They ran from the cross. They denied Jesus, and and they lived for self-interest. Thank God for these ladies that really picked up the proverbial mantle at the resurrection and moved things forward. For them, it all happened on a Sunday morning 
Two ladies, the Bible says here, Mary Magdalene and, and the other Mary. Mary apparently was a popular name. We've got a couple Marys here at the tomb of Jesus. And uh, there they are. They went to the burial place. When they arrived, there was an earthquake. The stone rolled away. The, the door was opened. And, of course, that was not to let Jesus out. He'd already risen from the dead. It was to let them see in. In verses 5 and 6 that we read a moment ago, the Bible uh, says that the angel spoke to them and said, Fear not ye. For I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He's not here. For he's risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. The final come and see in our series comes right here from the angel who said, Come see the place where he lay. Well, we know what they did not see when they went to the place. They didn't see Jesus. He was not there. He had risen from the dead, and, and he was gone. But, but we also know what they did see when they looked in. John's gospel gives us some insight in that. They saw the clothes Jesus had been buried in, the, the grave clothes, so to speak. They saw the covering that had been placed over the face of Jesus and how it was folded and carefully set to the side. They, they saw some amazing things that I'm sure were hard to process in that moment, but I want us to wonder what did the angel really want them to see and what did it mean when they came and saw the place where Jesus had been laying. That's what we're going to see today. Here's the first element in our study. Number one, they saw a place of proof. They saw a place of proof. Now, as these women evaluated the proof, they, they had to agree with the words of the angel who said, he, he's not here. He's, he's risen, you know, just like he told us he would do. The, the empty tomb served as evidence that Jesus is alive. Now, I know what you may be thinking. You might be thinking, well, they were able to examine some evidence, but we can't do that. Uh, we're a couple thousand years removed now. I don't know that we can boldly declare that the empty tomb a couple thousand years ago provides us with a proof today in this moment that can encourage our hearts. And, and I would agree with you to that end. But what we can do today is examine those who did examine the empty tomb. We can discern if their testimony holds up. I think by examining this story and their story, we, we actually begin to see that, that this empty tomb really does prove, in my heart, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. If, if Jesus' body was stolen, it would have had to have been taken from one of two groups, those that loved Jesus and were his followers, or it would do a, had to have been taken by those who were the enemies of Jesus and who hated him. Well, what do we know about the followers of Jesus? As I already told you, to a man, they, they ran from Jesus. Peter denied him three times in just a short period of time. They ran away from the cross. They thought when Jesus died, that was the end of the story for him. And we think of the enemies of Christ, those, those who didn't like him or appreciate him. Why would they have stolen the body of Christ? All they wanted to do was indeed testify that he's dead and he's in there. And, and had they stolen him, they surely would have, would have brought him out when the world began to say he was risen from the dead. They would have wanted everyone to see that. Anyone who had stolen the body of Jesus would have taken him in the grave clothes for sure. This was hardly the scene of a grave robbery. The angel originally said, come and see, but, but I want you to notice after that in verse 7, the angel said this, and go quickly and tell his disciples. Here's the idea. Come and see, go and tell. And you can't go and tell if you have not come and seen, if there wasn't a degree of certainty in your heart that what it is you were going to be sharing with others was indeed the truth. Later, Jesus was seen by others, and eventually he was seen of, of large crowds. And in 1 Corinthians 15, we read this. Paul writing, he said, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again uh, the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas. That we know is the name of Peter, the Aramaic name of Peter. He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Paul says, man, Jesus showed himself to over 500 people in one setting. He said, some of them are still alive. Some have died, but some are still alive. You can talk to them. He said, after that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, Paul said, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Following that, we, 
we see the emergence of the church and the growth of the church for, for centuries. Really, we know that the Jewish people worshipped on Saturday. And the Bible begins in verse 1 of this text by saying it was the end of the Sabbath. And in a very real sense, that was the end of the Sabbath as it related to those who became followers of Jesus. They began to worship on Sunday because that was a day of the week in which Jesus rose again for the dead. They wanted to begin every week by worshiping their risen Lord and Savior. So many of those who testified that the resurrection of Jesus suffered greatly. Millions of martyrs over the years. And for those early followers of Jesus who died, you don't die for a lie. They were convinced, absolutely convinced, that Jesus was alive. I, I wonder, and I ask today in, in a way that hopefully we'll just think together, do you believe that Jesus is alive? Have you come and seen and if so, will you be willing, based on what you've seen through faith, to go and tell? That's how it works. The angel said, hey, come and see. You've seen it? Go and tell. Spread the news. Let others know that Jesus is the King of kings, and he's the Lord of lords, and that he loves people. Get his message out as they came and looked in that empty tomb. They saw a place of proof. But secondly today, I want you to see that they saw a place of praise. Now, when you come to terms with the victory of Jesus over sin, death, hell, and the grave, it'll lead you to do some things, and praise is one of them. If you really understand what the Lord has done, it's going to do something on the inside of you. I want you to notice what we read in verses 8 and 9. The Bible says, and they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. And they came and held them by the feet. And they worshiped him. That was praise for Jesus. Now, if you were here in week one of our studies, I said we began in John chapter one, and we started with John the Baptist introducing the, the ministry of Jesus. And as Jesus was there and John the Baptist was ministering, he looked at Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. As I shared in that study, that was a word picture that, that those in that time would have immediately identified with the Old Testament scriptures. They would have thought of the lambs who were sacrificed. They would have seen Jesus in a, in a new light as John introduced him. But I'm telling you, these ladies, when they began to put it all together, they're seeing things more clearly, more vividly than they ever had before. They're thinking of lambs whose, whose lives were taken and blood was spilled to provide a covering of sin. And they're now identifying their Savior who died, thinking that to be the end of the story coming really just to honor the memory of Jesus and then understanding he rose again from the dead and, and they're seeing this is incredible what the Lord has done. They knew that the payment of Jesus as the Lamb of God, it would be enough for all time and for all people. And when you come to terms with the reality and the power of spiritual salvation through faith in Jesus, it will lead you to praise him. I remember when our church started our music was horrible. I was the music leader back then, okay? Uh, literally, it was embarrassing. I, I remember a few weeks in that one day I was doing my best. I got there early, set everything up in the community center and was welcoming people and trying to be nice to folks. And, and uh, I met a guy standing in the back and just said, hey, good morning, welcome to church, and, and uh, introduced myself. He said, uh, I'm a pastor from a church down the street. I just came to check the competition out. I thought, that's funny. I, I wasn't competing against you. I didn't realize we were a competition. But uh, he didn't want to sit down. He stood in the back with his arms folded. And I remember when I started leading the singing, he literally laughed at me and walked away. It was all glass windows in the back. I saw him walk all the way to the curb and, and get in his car. And I, I have to tell you, I agreed with him. His assessment of our music at that time, it was pretty laughable and it was embarrassing. What we would do is I had a CD player on the platform and there were a list of pre-recorded piano songs, just, just piano arrangement. And, and uh, so I would stand up and say, uh, good morning, take your songbook. We had red songbooks. I said, take your songbook, turn to page 336. We're going to sing Victory in Jesus. And then I'd turn around and I would hit number 16 on the remote control to get the, uh, the little boom box going. And then the piano music would come on. I've got to tell you, the piano player in that boom box could never keep up with me. She was either too fast or too slow, and I was always doing my best, and it was always pretty much horrible and embarrassing and humiliating. I didn't enjoy very much at all leading the music. I remember one day I got a call from a guy, and he said, uh, hey, Steve, I, I heard what you're doing. You're, you're doing your best to start a church, and he said, if you think it would be helpful, I'd be willing to come out for a few months, and I could play my guitar and lead the singing, and I thought, 
Yes, absolutely. I didn't know him very well at all. I'd met him. Uh, I didn't know if he could play the guitar very well. I didn't know if he could sing very well. I didn't care. I knew anything, even if it was pretty bad, would be an improvement over that which I was doing. I was singing on the front row. My wife was sitting next to me a couple weeks ago. She literally, in the middle of the service, she just stopped and she looked at me. She said, are you being for real right now? Is that really what your voice is sounding like? You know, I'm like, I'm trying my best. So not, not a great singer, okay? And uh, so I remember this guy came. He had about a two or three hour round trip drive to, to come and, and just to help us. And he would get there early and set up and, and uh, he would practice the music and he would have some people from time to time help him and he'd work with them. And I mean, the guy just went way above and beyond. I did not deserve his grace. And, and as I thought about what he was doing, I understood he was doing it for God. He was doing it for God. He wanted to be a blessing. He loved the idea of seeing churches started that are going to do their best to reach people. He's doing it for God. It also could have been said he was doing it for Coastline. He believed in what it was we were trying to do. He was doing it for our church. But, uh, you know, really, I had to come to the place where I understood, yes, he's doing it for God. Yes, he's doing it for Coastline. But he's doing it for me. We'd met. He'd heard of what was going on. He kind of felt bad. I was down there all by myself, and I was leading the singing, and he only imagined how, how that must have been. And he said, Steve, I want to come to try and be a blessing to you. It'll let you keep your attention on the sermons. And friends, listen, I could rejoice that he did it for God. I, I could rejoice that he did it for the church. But when I made the connection, wait, you're doing this for me? You're going out of your way. You're uh, spending the better part of your Sunday. You're doing all of this For me, it took my gratitude to a whole other level. And when you really understand not just what Jesus did in a theoretical sense for the world, but you understand had you been the only one, he would have done it all for you. That'll take our hearts to a place maybe they've never been before where we can rejoice and praise God. And as these ladies did, fall at his feet and worship and praise and adoration. These ladies weren't praising Jesus just because he killed death. They were praising Jesus because he killed their death. Yes, Jesus loves the world. John 3, 16, God so loves the world. I understand that what I'm saying today is we've got to come to the place where we can say, Jesus loves me. And when you begin to think on that, it'll lead you to see him in a light that will cause you to praise. I like how David in Psalm 146 said it. He said, praise ye the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. He said, praise ye the Lord, you all. He said, everybody praise the Lord. But then he said, praise the Lord, oh my soul. This is personal to me. Everybody should praise God, David said. But he said, man, that praise better begin in my heart. I better understand who he is, what he has done, and the great life that he's given me. I want to make sure I'm praising God. Now, I know we're all different a bit. We all have different personalities. I took a personality test this week, and it confirmed what I've known all along. I'm a weirdo, okay? Another, another test has revealed that to me. But, but uh, we're all different. I understand that. So I'm going to paint with a very broad brush today to make a point. I'm going to exaggerate uh, to make a point. There's a reason in church why some don't sing, why others sing a bit, and others just seem to be literally worshiping God in song. And I believe it's because some don't know what Jesus did. Some don't know who he did it for. And some understand Jesus did it all for them. What did they see when they looked in that tomb? Well, to them, they saw a place of proof. They saw it became a place of praise. But finally, today, I want us to see this. They saw a place of purpose. If you're still with me, say amen. Amen. Verse 7. The angel said, He goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I've told you. Angel, the word is angelos, it means, it means messenger. What, what did the angel say? He's going before you into Galilee. That's where you're going to see him. And then he said, there it is. I said what I'm supposed to say. Lo, I have told you. I'm a messenger. That was the message. Jesus is going to be in Galilee. You're going to see him there. This directive was so important to Jesus that on the night of his birth, or death rather, among the very last things he says to his followers in Matthew 26, verse 32, he said, but after I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. Yes, he he wanted to see them, and, and, and we know that they saw him prior even to the meeting in Galilee. 
Galilee. Yes, Galilee would have provided a measure of safety. The scrutiny of a meeting in Jerusalem at this time would have been incredible. But, but Jesus said, I, I have something to tell you. I need to meet you in Galilee. It was so important that this event was scheduled and announced over and over. And it was in Galilee that Jesus gave his final words before ascending back to heaven. And if they missed those words, they would have missed his purpose. They would have missed the meaning in our lives. For those of us that know the Lord, you see, it was in Galilee when Jesus finally got them together that he said this in Matthew 28 and verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. So they were sent here to a familiar place, a safe place, a place where the work of Jesus began in their lives. And it was there that Jesus shared the message we call the Great Commission. The Bible goes on in verses 19 and 20. We read, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Jesus was saying, hey, I did all of this for you. But don't get selfish with this. Don't get stingy with this. Don't get miserly with the truth that has changed your life. He said, I've done this so that others can know. Have you come and seen? Jesus said, then quickly, go and tell. Let your life be used to get the message out. Spread the news far and wide that salvation is available through faith. Jesus would say, in my victory on the cross by way of that empty tomb. We worship on Sundays. We've already seen because that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. And in a sense, every Sunday's Resurrection Sunday for those of us that know the Lord. But as far as our world's concerned, there's something extra special about this day that our world calls Easter. About this time we call Resurrection Sunday. It's important. Easter provides us with the perfect opportunity to invite people in our lives to come and see what it's all about. It's our chance to carry out this unmatched purpose we find in Jesus when he made it clear we're to tell others. And friends, this week is the right time. It's the best time to invite people to this place where they can hear of Jesus. No, we're, we're not here today like the angels that come see the place where he lay. But I can promise you if they'll come next week, I will have done my best to study and pray and prepare. And, and all of us that serve here and all of you, we can show up and we can do our best to convey the message of what it meant when Jesus rose again. Imagine with me if those of us who have come and seen would follow the angel's advice and quickly go and tell. Imagine if we'd go out of our way to invite friends and family and co-workers and, and neighbors. If, if we did that, I would imagine we could see people next week step on a property and be greeted by a happy parking lot attendant and, and a, a host out front and someone with some joy serving coffee and, and an usher on the inside saying, hello, good morning, can I help you find a seat? And instrumentalists who've been practicing to do their best for the glory of God and, and singers who will do their part to lead us in worship. I'm talking about a media team that will have been thinking and planning and praying through the whole service and, and, and all of it will be done so that when those who come can be exposed to the only message in all of the world that can bring the forgiveness of sins, the assurance of a relationship with God and the hope of a home in heaven one day. Imagine if we lived as though we believed that message and those of us who have come and seen would quickly go and tell. If you're here today and you're a believer, it all traces back to someone in your life who said, come and see. They may have articulated it a little bit differently, but for the sake of our study, what they were saying was, come and see, come and see. And friends, again, for those of us who know Jesus, let's not let that invitation find a dead end in our lives. Let's make sure we pass it on. Let's decide today to intentionally go out of our way to invite others to a place where they can come to know and grow in Jesus because that is what Easter's all about. Our Father, we're thankful today to be able to step in the pages of Scripture and to join in with these two ladies named Mary and to listen as the angel spoke to them and to take note as, as they looked in an empty tomb. And Lord, for that room, that, that tomb, that sepulcher, as the Bible calls it, with, with it being empty, it sure contained a lot of meaning for us today. We're thankful that you indeed are alive, that you rose again. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us based on that truth, on that reality to live lives that praise you and honor you, the lives of obedience to you. God, I pray that we find our purpose in you. Lord, you are so adamant that we get back to Galilee. And today, in a sense, we need to get back to Galilee, get back to those last words that you gave that should serve as our first concern. Lord, I pray by your power, you would impress upon the hearts of your people, those who know you, those who've come and seen, that we would quickly go and tell. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning. Thank you for watching today's service. It's our prayer, whether you're a friend near or far, that today's services were a help and encouragement to you. If you'd like to get more connected with us, stop by our website, or maybe you have a prayer request or a question that we can help you with, feel free to drop us an email. Again, these services are designed to help you encourage and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. If we can ever do anything for you, please let us know. And it's our prayer that we'll get to worship with you again soon.